So stress does three things. First of all, it makes us focused and alert. Second of all, it mobilizes us to fight against it. And third of all, it helps us better remember the, the threatful event so we know how to face it in the future. So during stress, we are more alert and focused. That's number one. We also limit bleeding in the event of a wound, relax our bladder muscles, so um, we don't have to use the bathroom, um, you know, reduce digestion, we blunt pain, we mobilize our body and the brain to be alert, etc. But the first thing is that we are focused and alert. And norepinephrine and dopamine increase our attention and sharpness. In fact, that's why stress makes you more alert and why people with ADHD need stress to focus and may need to even shoot them in the foot or even start a fight so that they can um, learn, so that they can focus better and, and learn better. And that's why procrastination is so common because they really need, you know, to have to be in a stressful state for those newer transmitters to get released so that they're finally able to focus because they need that stress so then they need those stressful neurotransmitters that we talked about previously like adrenaline and cortisol so they're able to be sharp and pay attention to whatever the teacher is saying for example they need, they need that stress to focus because stress makes us alert secondly stress mobilizes our uh, fuel to our body and our brain and epinephrine actually converts glycogen and fatty acids to glucose which is the main source of fuel for the brain in fact the brain even though it's 3% of, of, the, of the body's body weight, it consumes 20% of the glucose. It's, it's a glucose hog. And so when epinephrine helps make more glucose, which is the fuel for the brain, and cortisol makes more glycogen and replenishes the energy stores because epinephrine actually um, makes glucose from glycogen. So you have to replace that glycogen. And now what, what's, what cortisol does, so you have more energy stores to convert to glucose if you need as well. You don't wanna run out of these energy stores. Cortisol also stores belly fat, which is why people tend to gain weight when they're, when they're um, stressed. And then the third thing is that stress leads to cortisol, which causes hippocampal neurons to make glutamate, which leads to this thing called long-term potentiation, which is where the synaptic connections get stronger and stronger over time. So that's, an important, so that's an important component in remembering the threat and forming a memory of that threatful event. And hippocampus is, is a structure in the brain that's responsible for forming memories. And so stress um, leads to more activity in the hippocampus so that you're able to better remember that threatful event. Where has that lion be, have, has been before? Because you wanna know where it is so you can run away and, and avoid it. So it makes a memory of that um, threat. And in fact, the, the prefrontal cortex um, is what is, is, is like the executive boss. I think I talked about it. And it determines whether or not you should actually react to that um, threatful event. So cortisol causes more activity in the hippocampus, um, which is important in for forming a memory of the threat. Amygdala adds an emotion to the stress and the prefrontal cortex determine, determines whether or not that stress is something you need to react to. Is it just a piece of grass or is it or is it um, like a needle, for example, that you're about to step on to, onto? I don't know. It differentiates between what's actually stressful and what one isn't and it alters your, um, it regulates, the prefrontal cortex literally regulates your um, response, your um, um, the, the release of norp norepinephrine as well as the release of cortisol via the um, HPA axis, right? Um, um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal um, axis. So it regulates the stress response. So again, just to summarize, stress does three, three things. It makes us more focused. It mobilizes our brain and body. So it makes it activates our muscles so that we're able to, you know, do something about it, such as run away from us from a threatful situation. And then the last thing is it forms a memory of. Um, of that threatful event. And John Rady in, in his book calls it wisdom. So we're able to form a memory of that event. So stress does other things too. For example, it increases cravings. And so you want to eat more simple carbs and fats, which are not very healthy. So you go for that Dunkin' Donuts, which has the perfect combination of these ingredients. Um, and our media 
and are depressing news actually make us stressful too, without needing to expend energy to catch prey or even think about our next meal, what are we gonna eat? Which is what our Paleolithic forebears, or rather Stone Age ancestors, had to do. They had to literally um, chase their prey, they had to run a lot, they expended way more energy than what we do. Even what's recommended, like 30 minutes of walking or exercise every day, is not nearly, it's not even half is not even 50% to what they did in the past. So we don't expend a lot of energy, and yet we end up eating so much calories, and we literally have this energy surplus. We have too much energy, which is um, not what our ancestors did. We, ha we actually have too much energy that we don't even use. So we actually became more sedentary. We don't expend that energy, and we just plop in more calories leading to a mismatch between our lifestyle and our thrifty evolution, evolutionary genes. Because evolutionarily, our genes are, are for prosperity and for pro procreation. So, so essentially, we want to prosper and to procreate, and for that we need to survive. And so based on the, the Rinian's model, right, that um, um, we, we have to survive to pass on our genes, well, well we need to eat. It's, well, we need to eat and we need to have sex. To pass our genes to the next generation, so technically we need to we need to um, get get that food, and the way we did it in the past, right? Um, since Homo sapiens were first made two million years ago, up to ten thousand years ago, right? Um, until the um, industrial, like right, um, um, right when we are hunters and gatherers, we have to get that food, and so now we stop doing it, and we just became more sedentary and and plop in more calories. We eat more and we don't do much exercise. So stress and, and also loneliness can actually both lead to cravings, while exercise increases your social connections and helps replace cravings in a positive way. So the idea is to replace the cravings via distractions, healthy ones, to not do unhealthy habits like bad food, drinking alcohol, and even smoking or doing drugs. So you want to replace those negative habits with positive things to replace the cravings, like exercise, right? Like aerobic exercise, for example. So our body has three types of stressors. The first one is oxidative, which is where free radicals get made via fuel burning because the process of making fuel, right? Anytime we learn a new language, for example, or do anything that requires our brain, um, we need, our neurons need fuel. And the process of making more energy in the mitochondria, ATP of neurons, right? ATP, which is made in the mitochondria of neurons. As we make that energy, we also make these um, byproducts, these free radicals. And, these, and this is referred to as oxidative stress. We also have metabolic stress, where you don't, where you don't have enough um, um, fuel. And this could be because you, because you simply are not making enough ATP because, you're, because your cells are not allowing glucose to come in or are unable to accept that fuel, or simply because we starve ourselves through caloric restrictions. Both of these give rise to metabolic stress. And the last one is um, excitotoxic stress. And that's why we have this information overload and we constantly um, are, 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 are stressful and our brains constantly need to um, burn energy as fuel and eventually we run out of energy and so we don't have it and our cells, our neurons actually die. That leads to cell death. And this is actually what leads to neurodegenerative diseases. It's the loss of neurons. That's what leads to Parkinson's, that's lead, what leads to Alzheimer's. And so these are the three types of stressors, the oxidative, the metabolic, and the excitotoxic. So the goal is that you want mild stress because mild stress, as we saw, helps you increase resilience, like we saw in the example of shipyard workers study. How? Because exercise, um, vegetables, for example, as well, actually kale has a compound called sulfurophane, which is actually um, um, which is a toxin, but it allows cells to make more antioxidants. So, so we know that a little bit of, of toxins is actually good for you, as we saw in the shipyard study, right? And there's other ways to do it, like eating vegetables, exercising, and diet restriction, right? Diet restriction will lead to metabolic stress. And Mark Mat uh, Matson from National Institute of Aging um, used diet restriction in, um, in mice and made them eat only a third of their normal portions of their calories, I mean and they lived 40% longer, right? So this is an example of a hormetic mild stressor, diet restriction. And he wrote a book where he says, well, 
exercise more and eat less, right? To live longer. Because he's um, this big guy in the National Institute of Aging. But this is a classic example of how um, similar to the shipyard workers where they lived um, longer, they had a 24% reduction in the mortality rate than their counterparts who weren't exposed to any radiation at all. Mild stress is actually beneficial for you. Exercise also activates various growth factors like BDNF, IGF-1, VEGF, and FGF-2. And all of those growth factors collectively increase fuel to the brain, so the brain has more energy, as we saw in the, in, in the stress response. That's um, one thing that happens, right? We, we create more fuel, we mobilize fuel for the brain and for the body. And for the brain specifically, when our brain has more fuel, we're able to focus on the, on the threat. But these factors, on top of just making us, of course, alert and giving more energy to, to the brain and body to mobilize them, they also um, support neurons, as we saw in the last video, and they can also lead to long-term potentiation, which is good for learning, as we saw as well. So they lead to growth of new neurons, they lead to stronger synaptic connections, and they're also neuroprotective and prevent cell death. And that's how a hormetic stressor like exercise actually can not only strengthen neurons but also be protective for the actual cell via the creation of various neuroprotective factors and enzymes that that support and nourish neurons and prevent them from dying off so exercise is a mild stressor that allows us to better adapt and grow to future stresses and challenges by making those connections stronger and by and by stimulating neuroprotective factors that are good for the neurons they support our brain essential so it's a good thing to have mild stress now we don't want too much stress because actually everybody has a certain threshold which is determined partially by genes and partially by um, our environment and it can change over time depending on our environment and our behavior as well and people who have a higher self-esteem research shows actually have a higher threshold and vice versa people with lower self-esteem and lower and less confidence actually in, in themselves have actually um, a lower threshold for stress. But there's things that you can do to, to make sure you don't explode and don't go overboard because we all have a threshold. And these are having control over the stress. And I already talked about Jonathan Haidt's book in, in terms of happiness. There's things, there's things that cause stress, like when we um, when there's a lot of traffic outside, when there's a lot of noise, these unpredictable things that we can't control take away from our happiness and actually also impair our cognition and make us stressful and they're not good. So having control is definitely important, right? Setting your own goals, having control of your life. Um, finding healthy outlets like exercise. The author um, gave an example of a woman, Susan, who was very stressful and um, via, because other people had to do kitchen renovations in her home and she liked to skip rope and that helped her reduce her stress via a this um, like a, dis a healthy distraction so she wouldn't drink her chardonnay right via negative co uh, passive coping instead she's able to have more control so so having control having healthy outlets for the stress like exercise in her case skipping rope but can be anything that you enjoy social support as well as we saw with jonathan Haidt's book and having hope so something that, that gives you purpose, like for example, if you are um, part of a religious community and have some faith, that's definitely important. That helps you control that stress because you have people to share it with, right? And um, I think it was Penmaker who showed an, 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 an experiment, right? Whereby um, stress can actually help you grow if you write it out, right? So you're able to control it by talking about other people, by writing it out and finding meaning in it. All of those things are, are, are really, really important. And of course, um, yeah, having hope. Um, so you want to make sure all of these things to, to, are there to help you, that you don't exceed that threshold. So having healthy outlets, talking to people about it, not so, you, so you're not lonely because loneliness only will make that stress worse. And it can, right, it can actually lead to to, to stress being lonely is not good for the brain at all and having hope by joining by having some purpose um, um, being spiritual or joining or joining being part of a religious community all, all can help but you also want mild hormesis you don't want to raise that threshold but you also want a bit of, of hormetic stress which is neuroprotective for the brain and the way you can do it is by learning or 
challenging your brain. Anytime your brain is active, you're actually generating oxidative byproducts, which generate hormetic stress. So learning something every day is definitely good. Exercise, remember we talked about it in last um, 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 lesson, you, you want both, last video, you, you want both aerobic exercise or just movement to um, make actually more neurons, but you also want to learn a new skill or exploration or more environmental stimulation to really create that network of connections. So, so, so you want kind of, so you want exercise both movement and also some skill-based movement, more some complex movement that challenges your brain as well. Okay, so, and another way you can do it is via diet restriction. We saw the example of mice um, whereby they did not eat and um, or they only ate a third and they lived longer. And as well as your parents have always told you, eat your veggies because vegetables actually also have um, toxins that create neuroprotective effects for the brain.